more about clutter, I suppose, this morning than rubbish, because uh, I've been speaking to uh, a lady who's a decluttering <coughs> expert. Because hoarding, you know, is actually can be a medical condition. A lot of us are guilty of hoarding a little bit here and there, but for some people, <laughs> it becomes an extreme issue. So this morning, I've been talking to the hoarding expert, Heather Matwatso, and I asked her, first of all, just to tell me about exactly what she does. I run a social enterprise called Clouds End, and that helps people with hoarding issues. So I work with people one-to-one -one in their homes with their stuff and help them to come up with solutions that will work for them so that they can start to get clear, but also so that they continue to stay clear. Thank you for doing this interview, Bill. Can you tell me a bit about your early life? Well, I've had a good life. Yeah. Oh, it hasn't all been easy, of course. I was born on the 14th of December, 1944. Yes, back of 22 Aberdeen Street, opposite the Queen's Head. I was the third of, of four children. The first, Bert, was born in 1940, nine months after, after Dad was called up. Then Bernard, after a trip, trip home from leave in, in 1942. Then me, and then two years later, Little Billy, <laughs> conceived at a VE celebration at, uh, at the Queen's Head. <laughs> we were a family made by Hitler, all boys. Mum says the, the year I was born was a bitter winter, and things only got worse. Oh, I mean, having a drunk father and a two up, two down, and a toilet shared by three other houses was no way to raise a family. Mum was proud though. We never went to school without shoes. And she used to make clothes out of scraps. I can just about remember my dad. After the accident, little Billy fell in the cut. It went right through the ice. We tried to drag him out, but it was too late. Dad always blamed himself for the accident. <laughs> Mum blamed him too. After that, he, he couldn't work. Because of the grief, he said. Because of the drink, my mum said. <laughs> Dad disappeared after that. Went to the Queen's Head one night and never came home. <laughs> mum said he died, but Uncle Bernard said he'd gone off with the barmaid. Mum was a regular churchgoer after that, praying for Billy and Dad. But if there is a God, oh, I don't think he was listening. Losing Billy was the end for my mum. She could cope with Dad leaving, but, but no, not, not losing Billy. Broke her heart, the vicar said. Pneumonia, the doctor said. Us kids got split up around the family, or at least until we left school. After that, we were on our own. I go up quickly, might. Wasn't much I didn't know by the time I was 13. It was a good time to grow up, though. I thought I was, I was the bee's knees in me skinny trousers and brothel creepers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Elvis Presley. The Platters. Buddy Holly, Saturday nights at the Apollo Cinema. Yeah. I started work in 1959 as an apprentice at Mitchells and Butler's Brewery in Smethwick. I was aged just 15. Mitchells and Butler's, eh? Dad would have been pleased. This man from the council came round. It brings me this. 
Apparently, my neighbours have been making, making complaints about, about the accumulation of rubbish around this property. Overgrown garden. They don't think it's a, it's a healthy environment for their children to be around. Yeah, I'll read you this. You are hereby notified under the Public Health Act of... Oh, I don't know what... Uh, the notice to clean for four weeks action may be taken never heard so much rubbish Blooming jobs with i told him i told him he can he can shove it where the sun don't shine for all i care they've got no right coming round here and telling me what to do this is my home an englishman's home So how do you help people then? Because it's, I suppose the first thing is somebody accepting that it is an issue in their lives. Yes, I, I really I just start talking to people because I need to know lots and lots about them so that I can weave things they've told me back into potential solutions for them. So it's talking and, and just listening, listening and hearing really, and then um, using that information to help them. I'm coming, I'm coming. With you. Right. Did you ever get married? Married? Oh, yeah. First time I saw Miriam was in the queue to see some like it hot. Prettiest girl I'd ever seen. That's Miriam, not Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Took my breath away, she did. She was my Marilyn. <laughs> Took me three weeks to pluck up the courage to speak to her. Asked her to the dance at the Tower Ballroom. Couldn't believe my luck when she said yes. And I had to quickly get Bert to teach me the, the steps to the jive. Yeah. I still remember how she looked that night. I, I remember walking her home after the dance. She was 10 minutes late back and, and her mum and dad wanted her to speak to me and gave me a right talking to. Told me to stay away from their daughter. But I didn't. We got married at St Andrew's Church in October 1963. Yeah, it was a bit quick, but uh, we knew the vicar and, you know, he, he turned a blind eye to her... Um, condition well we did we didn't have a choice in those days reception at the queen's head followed by a week's holiday at butlins in prestatin luke was born in uh, april 1964 for the first few months we, we lived with miriam's mum and dad until we saved enough to to rent a place of our own then luke started school and miriam went back to work we were never rich, you know, but we, we got by. Of course, we couldn't go dancing anymore, but we had holidays in Western Supermare. Western Super Sludge, we called it. <laughs> he did well at school, Luke. A real bright spark. <laughs> Went to college and got himself a good job. I don't know, finance or something. I'm very proud of him. Of course, work took him away. He, he said he would like to visit, but, uh, you know, lovely grandchildren, Amy and Jack, <laughs> teenagers now. Always get a card at Christmas. Luke says he will come and visit soon, but, but he's very busy, you see. You're too busy. It's time's money. <laughs> But he, he keeps in touch. He's a good lad. Bill? Bill? How have you been since we last spoke? Oh, well, <coughs> I suppose I've been keeping pretty busy. Oh, no, they sent a social worker around. I ask you, a bleeding social worker. Chrissy, her name was, wanted to be my... 
advocate, whatever that is. Yeah, wanted to be my friend and ta take me through my journey. Journey, I said. I've never seen you before in my bloody life. I wouldn't let her in, of course. I was like, well, she's got no right coming round here trying to be my friend. Oh, I sent her away with a flea in her ear, I can tell you. You're not tidying nothing in my house. It's my house. Eh? These are my things. I'm not getting rid of anything. Not for you, not for the council, and not for any bloody avocado. I said earlier, though, know, I'll hoard a few things, a few football programmes, stuff like that. But this isn't what we're talking about here. This is extreme cases, yeah. isn't it? Yes, it is. Lots of people go, oh, well, how do I know? Yeah. Maybe I'm one, you know, how do, I, how do I work out? It's quite easy, really. If the stuff in your life impairs your lifestyle, as in you don't invite people around anymore or you think about it a lot or it stops you from using a room or rooms, then maybe it's time to think about getting some help. Why do the council want you to clear your stuff away? Why do I keep so much stuff? Well, I keep a lot of things, useful stuff. You never know when you might need something, you know. You might come in handy one day. Could have some value. Miriam, always knew think where things were. A place for everything and everything in its place. Nowadays, I can't even find the sugar. How many times have I told you, she would say, don't, don't, don't know where to put it, Look, always in the cupboard on the right hand side. I'll tell you what I don't want to forget. All my memories. Look here. Look, look, look at all this lot here. Oh, look. <laughs> Fred Astaire. The Tower Ballroom. Reminds me, they used to say, Miriam and me look like Fred Astaire and, and Ginger Rogers. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me, reminds me of all the good times we had. I don't want to get rid of the, all the things. Oh, look here, look here. Ah, I remember the footlings, footlings. Just get rid of this one. Butlins, Butlins holiday camp. <laughs> yeah. Miriam won the Miss Butlins pole side competition. Now we came third in the jive. Yeah. Dancing. Good times. Simple times. Every Saturday. <laughs> we knew how to enjoy ourselves. Oh, I tell you what, I could move in those days. We had a we had a special song when we were married. Eh? Sonny and Cher, I got you, babe. I got you, babe. <laughs> it was a special song. I wish we danced to at our wedding. Memories. That's all I've got left. I, I, I worry that. If I don't keep my things, and I, I will forget, and then it's as if nothing happened at all. This is a genuine medical condition, and is, is the one maybe common factor for people who are hoarders that they've all got in their lives that has led to them being such extreme hoarders? Well, everybody's different, so everybody has different reasons, but the most common factor is, well, is, is trauma, and, and that trauma involves loss, usually. So bereavement um, is the most common cause, or losing a job, or losing a partner, or even children leaving home can, can start it off. Miriam, she was taken ill. She found a lump. The big C. It was horrible to see her go downhill so fast. When the end came, it was, it was a relief, I suppose, in a way. She passed away. Only 54. 
passed away. Why do people say that? Gone to the other side, in a better place now. She died. She left me alone. Sorry. It was a difficult time for me after the funeral. I mean, Miriam was my world. She, she looked after everything, I suppose, you know, cooking and cleaning and paying the bills. Luke we went back to work, got married himself and moved away. And I, I was alone. Oh, I carried on working as long as I could. It was all I had. Things were never the same. I tried, really, really, really tried to, to get on with things and learn how to look after myself. Old dog knew tricks, I suppose. It wasn't easy. What happened later? Oh, I carried on as best I could. One day, work made me redundant, just like, like that. No warning. Laid off in the morning and I was down the job centre by the afternoon. Signing on the doll. Never felt so embarrassed. No, oh, I tried my hand a couple of odd jobs. It was a bloody waste of time. Nothing lasted. Too old, I suppose. No one wanted to give me a job at anything worthwhile, so after a while I stopped looking. Age 60 and on the scrapping. I suppose I might have tried to go on if circumstances had been different. I just didn't seem to have the, the heart for it, you know. Not without Miriam to help me. What sort of success rate do you get then of persuading people to unleash themselves of all this stuff that they're hoarding? Um, I suppose it would be, it depends what you classify as success. For me, success is when people start, first of all, talking about it um, and asking for help. That's already 50% of the job done. And then when people do small things, so they don't have to do huge clear outs. They've just got to start to take control. So as a success rate, I, I, I hope that the majority of people who I work with start to change their attitude to how they're living and that will help them then in future. I had a letter, another letter from the council. Here it is. The breaches complained of are set out in detail in the notice of eviction that is now served on you. In summary, they concern your failure to maintain the property in a habitable condition to the extent that it is now considered to be a public health hazard. Yeah, you bloody, 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 numerous complaints, health hazard. Four weeks notice to clear or vacate. Dispose of all contents. Entry required to carry out complete redecoration. Sanitise the garden. They're going to take my things. They're going to take my things. <laughs> 